And we're back. Uh, it's time to finally render. That's what I want to cover in this video. Um, now, before we render, I want to do just one last kind of once over in the scene and make sure everything has a material and a texture. Uh, all the textures are sized appropriately. Make sure I'm not missing or forgetting anything. Uh, and just, you know, generally, I don't want to forget anything before I start the sometimes long process of rendering. So I'm pretty confident on all my textures. I've, I've gone through all that. I've checked texture scales. Um, but we can also check and just add a little bit of kind of more organic nature. So for instance, I'm going to take my pylons here and I'm going to uh, separate this pylon out, and you can actually separate all of them, but we'll separate this pylon out uh, by selection, and actually we will separate all of them. Okay, so I'm just going to separate all of those, then we will tab back into object mode, and I'm just going to move them around slightly so they're not in a perfectly straight line, perfectly evenly spaced. Now when I do that, you know I have these uh, lights that are also in there, and I want to make sure I grab those lights too so that they stay connected. We can also parent them if we really were concerned about it, but I'm only going to move these once, so we'll be all right. I'll do this from top view so I don't have to worry about the height. And something like, whoops, grab those two. Maybe we'll move this one down and over a little bit. And make sure, whoops, I'm going to grab that light. There we go. And move this one over a little bit as well. Uh, if you want to, you could also maybe rotate them. And it'll maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe this pylon right here got hit a little bit. Oh, you can see that it's rotating around my 3D cursor. I don't want to do that. Um, so let's tab into edit mode. I'm going to grab the base vertices here. Shift S, cursor to selected. Tab back into object mode. And then we can rotate this, oops, rotate around 3D cursor. There we go. Just give it a slight rotation there. So we get a little bit of variation there. It just helps the whole city feel a little bit more run down, a little bit more decrepit. Uh, we'll do the same thing here. So we'll go into Wireframe, we'll grab the, just those bottom vertices, and we'll snap the cursor there. Back in object mode, grab both of those things. Maybe this one is, we'll rotate it from the side a little bit. Something like that. And then maybe over a little bit. And I don't want to go too far because I don't want it lifting out above the ground. But enough that it feels a little. Uh, a little old, a little aged. It's been there a while. It's not quite as pristine as it once was. You can do the similar thing all around here. Um, you know, kind of rotate some things. Maybe this sign is a little bit crooked, and you can kind of. Oops! Again, we want to go meeting point. Do something like that if you wanted. And maybe I'll do it just a little bit. Yeah, I can do something like that. Okay. So once you do all of that, um, let's see what else I wanted to kind of do little last minute checks on. Oh, yes. Light intensities. So I know we've talked about lighting a bunch, but um, now's also a good time to just double check the intensities of your light. So if we go into rendered view here, take a second to update. But uh, we should also make sure that we are using scene lights and the scene world so that we're getting the true representation of our light intensities. Okay. And I think, uh, generally speaking, I think we're okay. Um, should note, if you skipped the last part about adding the, or making the ground look wet, I do have a world um, image, or a world texture, an HDRI image uh, that I'm using. It's actually the same one. If we go, if we turn off scene world, it's this one right here. Um, 
can also go into material preview and you'll be able to see it more accurately. I just did a search for a free HDRI or something like that and found it. Um, so you can use that same one if you want. Um, I don't have that link anymore, unfortunately, but you can kind of see the reflections in the ground here. All right, so that's that's giving some light. I don't want to use that um, to light my scene, so I'm going to temporarily turn down that strength. This is really only to show up in reflections. Um, and you can see we're getting a lot of that right now. So I just want to focus on the actual light objects in my scene. So I'm going to turn that down to 1. We'll jump back into rendered view here. Or, excuse me, turn that down to 0. And before I forget, we'll turn on screencast keys. So I want to check our intensities. I want to check our positions. Um, generally speaking, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. This light right here on the vending machine. I am going to uh, hit G to move it and double tap Z to move it on its local Z axis. And I'm just going to push it up a little bit. Just a little bit. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm just going to hit G and uh, Z. Move it up a little bit. Gives my camera a little bit more um, room. If I am using some volumetric kind of fog, I don't want to see that source terminate. Okay, so I think we're good there. Um, next, we need to figure out and, and double check our camera depth of fields. So I'm going to use this camera right here as my uh, demo camera here. And right, so I've got that enabled. We'll turn our world strength whoops, back up to 1. And by default, depth of field is not enabled on cameras. So we want to go to the camera uh, properties and turn on depth of field. And then we can either set a specific focus object or set a distance. Uh, for still renders, it doesn't really matter. If I'm doing animations, I will usually add a, an empty to the scene. And that will be my focus object. So I can animate the focus uh, separately. That's a little bit more intuitive. Uh, but we can also just use distance. Uh, then we also want to make sure that we have our uh, show limits enabled on this camera. That way, as we bring our distance in, we're going to get this gold crosshair or yellow crosshair. This will tell us where our depth of field is. So you can see where this kind of arm of the crosshair term, or intersects with the wall. That's our plane of focus. Okay, so if we want to focus way out by the sign, let's focus on the sign. And then as we bring it in, so here we're focused on this first electrical panel. Now we can't, we can see a little bit of the, the depth of field effect here. Um, you may need to, can't remember if we need to enable it in the viewport. Maybe not. It might have been an older version of Blender that we had to enable it in the, View properties. Um, but to make it a little bit more apparent, we can adjust the f stop. So 2.8 is already pretty low. Um, you can type in any number. Lower is going to have a more uh, pronounced effect of depth of field, higher is going to have um, less uh, a pronounced effect. So basically, it's a greater depth of field, more is going to be in focus with a higher number. So if I set this to, let's say, 32. See, everything is pretty sharp in the frame. If I set this to 1, now we have only a small amount in focus. Okay, Works the same as an actual camera, um, and because I am very familiar with cameras, uh, I'm going to use actual f-stop numbers, but you don't have to stick to the traditional f-stop increments of 2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, um, 8, 11, all that. You can type in any number. But let's go with like 1.4. I don't want to go too far. If we go too far, if I go to like 0.2, this is this is just way too much. Um, it also it tends to have a, a an effect of making the scene feel miniature. Okay, it throws off your perception of scale. And you see that in uh, something called tilt shift photography. And what that is, is it's a way to basically have really extreme depth of field for real life photos. So these are photos that are 
not of sets, they're not of miniatures, they're not of models, they are actual places. But by using a tilt shift lens, you can make things look really small. So this is uh, Las Vegas. And just by, you know, how shallow this depth of field is, it, it feels like we're looking at toy cars. Okay, but we're not. And it's all because of the depth of field. So um, now tilt, tilt shift works a little bit differently. It's not actually depth of field. It's shifting the plane of focus. But essentially that you get similar effects. So you don't want to go too low on that. Um, so maybe 1.2. We'll see what that looks like. That looks pretty good. And then we need to decide where we want the focus to be. Whoops. Did the wrong thing there. Distance is what I want to affect. Um, so we can go and, and decide if we want the vending machine to be in focus or if we want the electrical panels to be in focus. And if, let's say we want the electrical panels to be in focus. We could either set the distance there. We could also use this eyedropper and pick a point that we want to be in focus. So let's say right there. So that's always going to be in focus no matter where we move the camera. We can hit N to bring up our uh, view uh, properties here. Turn on lock camera to view. And then we can, I'm going to go to frame 10. I'm going to orbit the camera around. Okay, so let's say we want to focus on that panel. I do want to still see the vending machine. Maybe we'll do something like that. Okay, I think that's going to look pretty good. All right, and then I'm going to hit I to insert a location and rotation keyframe for my camera. And so I, I changed frames so that I have basically both uh, options still saved. I'm not going to be actually animating between the two, but I have, I've got them both more or less saved. I'm going to turn off lock camera to view. I'm going to hit N to hide that. And we've got our depth of field set. Cool. All right, so now we are ready to uh, start talking about some of these render settings. We'll go to the render properties here. I'll kind of work from the top down. I'm not going to cover everything. This is more of a, a practical how I'm rendering this scene than it is. Here's all of the options for all of the rendering. If you want to know more about any of the uh, settings, then I would encourage you to check the Blender manual. Uh, usually you can right click, I think. I think you can right click on it. Oh, maybe you can't. I thought you could. Yeah, there you go. You can right click on most fields and go directly to the online manual or F1. Uh, and that will open up the manual. So we'll do that on this render samples. And you see it opens up the cycles manual right here. And then from there, you can go in and look at sampling and figure out what everything does, which is great. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to start. We are rendering with cycles, not EV. Uh, our feature set is set to experimental, and that's because we're using the adaptive sampling for the subsurface modifier. That gives us the displacement uh, texture effects that we're going for. Device, I'm currently rendering with CPU. Uh, that's because if we look at my, my VRAM, my video RAM down here, my video card has 8 gigs of RAM. Um, between all of the 4K textures in the scene, which again, I can't stress enough, I should not have done that many 4K textures, but I did. Um, between that and the fact that I'm screen recording and I've got two 4K monitors running, uh, my video card is already maxed out. So I'm looking to upgrade that from a 2080 to like a 3080. But while I wait for video cards to be available, uh, for now I'm using CPU rendering to not completely overwhelm my system. However, normally, or often, GPU rendering is faster. So you can set that to GPU. Um, we can also go up to our edit preferences. And for, uh, I believe it is in the system. Yep, we've got our cycles render devices. You can choose your graphics card there. So there's my uh, 2080. And then I also have uh, my CPU is available as well. Um, if you're using optics, you can enable your optics. But we're going to keep it on CUDA. We're just in the CUDA tab. This is what I'm concerned about. So I'll keep it on CPU for now. Uh, grease pencil we don't need to worry about. Sampling. So this is basically your quality setting. 
we've got an integrator, so we have path tracing and branch path tracing. This is for more kind of advanced and fine-tuned control. If we enable that, now we've got the ability to set samples on a per light path kind of degree. So we can set the samples individually for, div for diffuse uh, samples, for glossy samples. Uh, I'm going to just leave it at the kind of the basic one. Then we have a render sample setting and a viewport sample setting. So viewport is just when I go into rendered view. This is what viewport samples are affecting. You can see up here it's counting up to, in this case, 512. Uh, usually you don't need yours that high. You can. I often keep mine at 128. You can see that changes that to 128, and you can see how it's going through and how quickly or slowly it's rendering. The render is when I hit render uh, or uh, render image. There it is. How many samples we use when we do a, a proper render. So I'm going to go back to material preview because I don't need to be rendering the viewport and rendering um, an actual image at the same time. And let's see, we're not going to worry about adaptive sampling. Denoising, this is a, an important one that can help save some render time for sure. We can set de denoising ind individually for both rendering and viewport. So if I, again, if I go into rendered in the viewport, I can set denoising. I'm going to leave that off for now, again, just because I'm already taxing my resources pretty heavily. Um, but we'll look at it with render. So we've got three options here. We have NLM, which is kind of the older, original Blender denoising uh, algorithm. And this can run on any compute device. So this can run on CPU or GPU. Then we have optics, which is NVIDIA's um, AI denoiser algorithm that uses GPU acceleration but you need to be rendering with the GPU in order to use it. And then we have Open Image Denoise, which is Intel's AI denoiser, and that runs on the CPU. So we can kind of look at a couple of comparisons. I'm going to hit F11 to bring up my render window. I've already done some renders before I started recording. And if we look at go to slot two here, and you don't really see a whole lot of noise, which is good. I render this at uh, 256 samples but that's a little bit low. But if we zoom in here to the vending machine and the glass, this is where we're going to just always see a lot more noise because we're looking uh, at a transparent material. There's light on both sides, and there's reflective surfaces, lights bouncing around all over the place. There's a lot of calculations that need to happen. So this is uh, with the NLM uh, denoiser. And then if I go into slot three, this is with the open image denoise. Okay. And I can hit J and Alt J to switch between slots. Okay. And we can see the difference. We can even see it up here. It didn't look like there was any issues up here, or at least nothing obvious. But as we swap back and forth between the two, we can see that there certainly are issues. That's still not perfectly clear. The samples are still probably too low at 256. But you can see the difference that using the right denoiser has on our scene. So I would encourage if you're using CPU, I would use open image denoise. If you're using GPU, give optics a chance. Um, it'll probably look pretty good. Now, I also want to issue an additional word of caution. If I go to slot four here, I'm going to set my render samples down to 64. Okay. And uh, F12 is a shortcut to render. You can also go to render and render image. But as this renders, this will probably take um, a minute or two. But as uh, this goes through the render, what you're going to notice is first you're going to see the cells, the areas that start to render without any image denoising on it. And that's normal. No, I'm also zoomed way in. Okay. And then you're going to see this little cell moving around. This is the one that's actually doing the denoising. So you can see this is what it looks like without denoising, and this is what it looks like with denoising. Now, the thing that you need to watch out for is if your samples are too low, there's not going to be enough information there to accurately figure out what it's supposed to look like denoised. And you're going to get this kind of weird, almost JPEG pixely thing. The edges aren't going to be very crisp. Um, and that's going to be an issue, right? 
So if we compare this to slot three, okay, this is going to be the same, the same bolt here. Just kind of line them up, maybe. Oh, you know what? I changed the camera angle. That's why this isn't lining up. So we need to. There we go. A little bit. So this is the bolt that we're looking at. On this one, it's over here. This one, it's over here. So it's a lot crisper here with more samples than it is over here. So that denoising isn't going to work miracles, but it can certainly save you a lot of time because you don't have to set the samples crazy high. Um, okay, so while that does that, and you can see that with the open image denoise, the denoising process can take a little while. The other two options don't take quite as long to denoise, but this works pretty well. So it's kind of, tr again, a trade-off between how many samples you want and denoising. I'm going to cancel that, that render. Okay, I set this back up to 256. And let's keep scrolling down. We've got some advanced options for our noise pattern. Don't need to worry about that. Light paths. So light paths, I, I believe I've talked a little bit about. I think if not, we can do a, a kind of a once over. So the default is, it's actually not saved as a, as a preset, uh, but the default is very few samples. I think it's like 12 and these are set to 12. Uh, but this is how many basically how many bounces of light it's going to calculate for each type of light. So diffuse, uh, glossy, transparency. So transparency is a really important one if we're looking at like our vending machine that has clear shelves and a clear window. It's going to need to pass through the outer surface of the front glass, the inner surface of the front glass. Actually zoom in here so we can see this. If we're looking at this, we've got the outer surface, the inner surface, and then we've got the top side of the shelf and the bottom side of the shelf. And all the all these different surfaces that it needs to pass through in order to make it to the inside of the vending machine. So we need to make sure that our our samples are high enough for transparency in order to make it all the way through. Otherwise, it's just going to, the light's not going to make it, it's going to die, and it's just going to be completely black. So if you're seeing um, black on the inside of your, um, or on the other side of glass or transparent surfaces, you may need to up your transparency uh, bounces. Now, what I like to do is kind of take the shortcut and just choose full global illumination. It's going to set everything to 128, which some oftentimes is a little bit overkill. But on the testing that I've done between full global illumination and limited global illumination, I have seen very small difference in render times. So I'm just going to keep it at the, at the full global illumination. I'll get great results and not worry about it. Okay, next we have clamping. So what clamping does is, I don't think we're going to really see any, uh, any examples here. Oops, I didn't mean to hit render. The slot one. So clamping, sometimes when you're rendering, you're going to get something called fireflies. And fireflies are like a single, very bright pixels. And clamping is a way to get rid of those, um, but it does so at the cost of accuracy. Um, it does it by basically saying no pixel can be brighter than this. All right, so by default, uh, the direct light clamping is off and indirect lighting is set to 10. Um, I'm going to leave it that way. We're not really going to use it, um, but it can it can be helpful in, in certain situations. Uh, caustics are the um, basically rendering through transmissive or, or translucent surfaces. Uh, we can actually... Let's go to the online manual and get a better, um, better wording than what I'm giving you uh, right now. So if we go into do it in the light paths, here we go. So caustics. Um, while principal path tracing supports rendering of caustics with a sufficient number of samples in practice, it may be inefficient to the point that there's too much noise. So yeah, basically caustics take a lot to to render and it's light passing through a surface and generally like if it, it's if you're passing light through like a green glass material that light is going to be green when it hits the ground and it's that sort of calculation that takes a lot um, if you don't have anything that would be doing that in your scene you can turn them off and save some 
resources. But if you do, you kind of need to have them on. Um, I know it's not a very great explanation of caustics, but I promise there are other people with much more experience in the matter who can explain that far better than I. Um, volumes we're not going to worry about. The default's fine. Same thing with uh, subdivision. Although we can set kind of our global uh, subdivision setting there. Hair we don't need to worry about. Simplify. So simplify is nice. Um, I know we talked about it already a little bit, but as far as rendering is concerned, we can set, if we want the textures to, um, we don't need to do the whole 4K texture calculation. We can set the texture limit to 2048, like I have up here in the viewport. Uh, but this can also be useful just for testing if you're focused on making sure your lights are all set and you're doing a bunch of test renders back and forth. Uh, this is really, really running slow right now. But if you're doing a bunch of test renders back and forth, you can set your subdivisions down to zero and speed up your scene um, because your your geometry will be changed, but your textures will look fine. And this is... I think my uh, my blender is slightly locked up. Oh no, I was I think I was just in a field. Okay, we're fine. Okay, so we can set our simplify. We just check the box to turn it on. And things are running really slow right now. Okay, so we check the box to turn it on, and then we can set both our viewport and our render. So if we set the subdivisions down. Um, that can speed things up. Like I've already got it for my um, for my viewport, so turning it off is going to slow down the the scene a bit because every subsurface modifier that's still applied is now basically taking effect. So I'll keep that on for now. Um, but the texture limit can be nice uh, to speed up some renders. If you don't need the full 4K texture, then you turn that on. Um, coloring grease pencil, we're not going to worry about. Motion blur, we don't need to worry about because we're not animating. Film, film is an important one. So we can, we can do an exposure adjustment. I never really mess with this. Uh, if I need my light to change, then I'll just change the lights. But if you need kind of a global adjustment, then you can adjust the exposure. But transparent, this one's important. If you're rendering and you want the background to be actually transparent, yeah, so like what this checker pattern is over here, then you need to make sure you enable transparent. Um, it's maybe a little counterintuitive that it's in the film section. But that's where it is, and make sure that is enabled. Um, and then transparent glass as well, if you want to be able to see the transparent background through the glass. Uh, performance. So performance is a um, bunch of settings in here. I think the only one we really need to worry about these tiles. Well, I guess threads too. So I leave it on auto detect. It's going to detect how many, basically how many cores your CPU has or your, or your GPU. Um, and it's going to, basically that's how many, um, how many cells it can render at a time. So again, if I hit render, oh, I'm rendering over the wrong slot. That's right. Uh, you'll see once this does its initial calculations, there we go. Okay, so each one of these squares is what is a tile, and it's 32 pixels by 32 pixels. And the threads tell, uh, say how many of these it can render at, at a time. So auto detect is usually the way to go on that. And then tile size. If you're rendering CPU, generally smaller is better. If you're rendering GPU, you're rendering with your graphics card, generally larger is better um, and then also you want to stick to powers of two so uh, 16 by 16 32 by 32 64 by 64 uh, 128 by 128 256 by 256 and then 512 by 512 would be the upper end um, usually not that high but that um, that's the progression that you'd want to do 16 32 64 128 256 512 um, and again, I would encourage you to just do some tests and figure out which one is working or, or which size exactly is faster uh, on your specific system. I'm going to cancel this render. But we can also, there's a little bit of a shortcut. 
we go to our preferences and we go to add-ons, uh, I believe, there we go. If we search tile in the add-ons, we have this auto tile size option. So if we check that box, it's going to enable this add-on and it's going to automatically uh, tell you what the right tile size is and set it. So if I'm at uh, CPU, it's saying 32 by 32 is the optimum size. You can also see our powers of two progression down here. Uh, if I go up here and change it to GPU, let me just collapse the light paths for now and we'll collapse simplify, collapse film. Uh, it changed from 32 by 32 to 240 by 216. Okay. So that can be helpful um, as you're going to get a slightly more optimum. I don't know what I just did there. Object modes. Oops. Um, and we'll, I'm just going to disable that though for now. Okay. So let's go back to 32 by 32 and make sure we're on CPU. And you're probably going to want to be on GPU, but for right now, I'm going to keep it on CPU. Uh, so that's the performance settings. We don't need to worry about bake. We don't need to worry about freestyle and color management using an sRGB display device. We're going to use filmic uh, transform. We don't really need to worry about any of that. We're going to keep that pretty simple. And then we can come over here to our scene settings, and this is where we set our resolution. So if I go into camera view, and if I adjust the resolution, we can see that it's adjusting um, the aspect ratio. Now it's a little counterintuitive here because I'm increasing the X, but it's only, it's actually in the viewport, it's decreasing the Y. Um, and it's because it's paying attention to the ratio between the two. You can see I can increase the Y again and adjust that. Oh, I don't know why that jumped. Um, so it's, it's taking into account both the resolution and the aspect ratio. But we also have some presets here. And I mean, for our purposes, HDTV 1080p is fine. We don't need to do any 4K rendering. You're welcome to do that on your own, but it will take uh, considerably longer. Um, aspect ratio, we're going to keep this at 1 to 1. This is the pixel aspect ratio. And we want to keep that at 1 to 1 unless you're doing, you know, anamorphic stuff, but we're not. Uh, render region, again, if you're using a render region, you've got some redundant uh, settings here that you would also have in view um, render region there. Frame start and end step, that's all for animation. Frame rate, that's for animation. Uh, the last thing we really need to concern ourselves with is output. So when we're rendering still frames, um, this output directory doesn't really matter. What does matter is our file format, our color, and compression. And we don't need to worry about image sequence. So because we want to have transparent backgrounds, we need to use an option that has transparency. And PNG is just fine for that. But we also need to make sure that we have the color set to RGBA. So red, green, blue, alpha is what that A stands for. And that's important. Color depth will be fine at 8. Bit depth and compression. Uh, I'm going to slide this down to 0. So see in the tooltip, 0 is no compression with a fast file output. 100 is maximum lossless compression with slow file output. Um, I'm just going to do no compression. I've got plenty of space on my computer to store one, no com uh, one PNG with no compression. Okay. Once we have all that, we're ready to render. So I'm going to go back to my render uh, options here and just look at our sampling because really when I'm rendering, this is what I'm focusing on. And hit 11, uh, F11 to bring up my render view. We can kind of look at, at some of the past ones um, as we're going, but I'm just going to go to slot one and I'll set the render to We'll just keep it really low for now. Set it to 128 and hit render. And it's going to start rendering. So it's, we've, we've seen this before a number of times already, 
HUD. It's going to calculate the scene and kind of load up all the textures and, and all the images and everything it needs. And then it will start rendering our, um, our tiles from the center out. By default, you can change this render pattern if you want. Uh, but the kind of center out spiral works for me. And then once it's done, once we have a finished scene, and I'm not going to wait for it, you can see we do have um, what frame we're rendering, how long the last, how long it took to render last time, its current time of rendering, and how much is remaining, as well as how much memory we're using. And hit Escape to cancel that render. It's going to jump to another save or render slot. And so once we have our render, what we need to do is save it. It doesn't save it automatically uh, when it's rendering just still images. So we go to uh, Image and Save As, and we can navigate to I have a Renders folder. We've got a lot of renders, but we're going to call this... Uh, I'm just going to grab that file name, so we're going to call it Cyberpunk Street, and then we'll call it M3 and we'll do like V1. If I have multiple versions, do V1 or you can do 01. Actually, just for clarity, so Cam 3, 01. Okay, so it's Camera 3 that I'm rendering, and this is the first version of it. Again, we have our file format options up here, and I'm going to click Save As. Once we have that, um, I can navigate to it in my file browser, which is called, there it is. And here's our image. It's got a transparent background. Now, Windows Photo Viewer is showing it as a dark gray, but that is a transparent background. Uh, it also, that's right, I don't have any depth of field here because that was a different version. So, We've got it rendered. That's how you render things. Um, it's going to be a fair amount of back and forth as far as hitting render on something, checking your settings, making sure your samples are high, adjusting the samples, rendering again. So one thing that you can do is I'll go to slot one and in my viewport here, just as a kind of quick workflow example, if I'm concerned about the samples in the vending machine, I'm going to go over this. I'm going to hit control B. We'll just do a border region there, or render region. And I'll set my samples to, I so we'll start with 128. And I'll hit render. And it's only going to render that, which is awesome. It's going to calculate all of the, you know, the scene textures again. So that'll still take the first 15 or so seconds. But once it does that, I'll start rendering. And it is out of focus, but that's fine and then it goes through and does its denoising. Okay, and then we can go to slot two. Make sure you change slots before you render, otherwise it'll render over the other slot. And we can upper samples, and maybe now we'll go to 512. And I'll hit F12 to render again. And it's going to take the same 15 or so seconds to rebuild the, or to load into memory everything from the scene. And then it's going to take, you know, we, we quadrupled the, Samples, so it's probably going to take roughly four times as long. So if it took 20 seconds last time, it might take a minute and 20. This time, I will pause the recording and we'll see how long it actually takes. Okay, I was off uh, in a good way. It actually only took 38 seconds. But now, if we hit J and Alt-J, so J will cycle between slots forward. Alt-J will cycle between renders, render slots going backward. Uh, but we can zoom in here. And here's our uh, slot one, which is 128 samples. We can open up the sidebar here and look at, I believe it's an image, and metadata. There we go. So we can actually see what our samples were set to. So this is 128 samples. Then if I hit J, we're in slot two, and we're at 512 samples. So we can go back and forth and kind of see we're getting... A little bit of um, kind of muddiness there. You can see we're getting a little bit more clarity. Even though it's out of focus, we're still getting more clarity in slot two.
And then what I would do is I'd probably go into slot three and go up even higher. I'd go to 1024 or 2048. I tend to double um, samples as well. You don't need to, but I tend to also double samples. But I'll set that to 1024. Let's open up our render view again with F11. Go to slot three. Okay. Um, you can also do this in render, just view render is what I'm doing there. And then I will hit F12 again, and we'll go through and render. So let me pause it again, and we'll come back in a second. Okay, that finished rendering. So let's zoom in here. And again, I'm going to hit N to bring up a side panel, put image, and turn on metadata. And we'll zoom in here pretty far. Okay, so here's 1024 samples. Here's 512. So double the samples. We're getting a little bit more clarity there. Not a whole lot. A little more. more. The, the highlights are becoming more prominent. And especially when you compare it to 128. You can see the difference in samples there. I want to do one more render at uh, 2048. And then um, last thing I want to talk about is an optional step to add some volumetric fog. So be right back with a higher quality render. I'll set this to... 2048 and make sure we are in slot four and we are okay okay and the 2048 samples has finished so again we will i don't know why this closes every time we can also keep an eye on the render time so that took a minute 30 to render versus 54 seconds for 1024 samples 38 seconds for 512 samples and 23 seconds for 128 samples um, but between 1024 and, and 2048, again, these highlights are becoming more apparent, which is quite nice. You see the denoiser when there's not enough samples, it just, it doesn't know that they're there and it kind of glosses over them. So, um, even though we're using denoiser, we still want to make sure the samples are high enough to get some nice detail there. All right. So that's, that'll get you good for rendering. Um, if you really want to start abusing your render times then what we can do is we can add some fog. So first I'm going to just go to um, clear my render region. And let's kind of orbit around here. Let me grab my wide camera. I'm going to hit control number pad zero to make that my active camera. And talk a little bit about volumetric fog. So let's go to our shading workspace. And if we go to rendered view, Right now, we're not going to see any fog. This is none in there. Now, I believe I've, re I've recorded this. I Sorry, I don't remember explicitly. But what you can do is if we go to our shader editor and change this from object to world. Yeah, okay. So it's in there. I must have, I must have recorded this before. We can make our world you know, add a, a principled volume shader. Set the density to something low like 0 0.03. Okay, and then we can connect that to the world volume. And when we do that, we get some fog in our scene, or some haze, some atmosphere, if you will. Now the problem with this is that by doing this on the to the world, it's basically blocking all the light coming from our background image, from our HDRI image because this image is mapped to the world basically an infinite distance away. So no matter how thin we make the density of our volume, it's still going to completely occlude the image. So the way to get around this, one, if, if you don't care about having the image, then you're fine. You can just leave it like this. But if you still want to see those highlights that you get for having the world in there, then we need to add this volume shader in a different way. So let's do that now. We're going to go into solid view. And we can go, um, doesn't matter, side or top view. I'm going to hit Shift S and snap, actually, Shift C. I'm going to snap the cursor to the center of our scene. And then I'm going to hit Shift A, add a cube. I'm going to tab into edit mode, select everything, and I want to scale this so that all of the uh, cameras, or all the objects are, are in it. But I'm also going to put most of the lights 
in it as well. So I'll scale in the X, I'll scale it in the Y. Okay, and then I'm going to take this face right here and move it up. Oops, and I accidentally hit play for some reason. Okay. So once we have it encompassing the scene, tap back into object mode. I'm going to go to my object properties here on the right. Scroll down to viewport display and set display as wire. Okay, so we're only looking at the bounds there, or, or the, the wireframe. Um, you could also set it to bounds, but for a simple cube, it's not really any difference. Okay, so we've got that. We're going to hit F12 to name this. We're going to call this fog domain. And I'm going to move this to my camera and light slayer. Um, just it makes sense to me because it's definitely going to be affecting the lighting. Okay, so now that we have that, we need to give it a volume shader. So I'm going to go to my materials, click new, give it a new material. We'll call this fog. And I'm going to change this from object or from world back to object so we can see our shader. And I'm going to grab my principled shader, shift S. And I'm going to switch this to a shift S shader and switch it to a principled volume. And then we need to set the density down, 0 0.03, I think it works pretty well. And we need to make sure we change this from connected to the surface. We want to connect it to the volume instead. Now I'm going to save this, save my scene, because this is a pretty intensive uh, render process. So let's actually, let's, let's do this. Let's not render the fog for first. I'm going to set my samples down to 128. It's super low, but uh, just so I can get a quick render. And then I'm going to go to slot one. And we'll hit render. So this will render the whole scene without the fog. So we have, basically, we'll have a before. And then we'll render it with the fog. And we'll have an after. And I'll talk about a couple of things to pay attention to when you're rendering volumetrics like this, especially when we're dealing with uh, denoising. Okay, so there is the render. Uh, just finished up 128 samples without any volumetric fog. Uh, and that looks great. It's probably a little bit low on samples. Let's see, we're getting some... It's just, it's just low res. It kind of looks like a, a bad JPEG. Um, but it's not bad, especially from, from zoomed out. Let's go to slot 2 and turn on our fog domain. We can preview it if we go into a rendered view here. Again, this is going to take a second, but now we can see that we've got some fog in the scene. And uh, we'll hit render and see how that goes. OK, it's all done. And we can compare here's with the volumetrics. And if I hit Alt J, go back to slot one, there's without. So it does a number of things. Um, we start seeing the source of the lights a little bit more. So you can see that's why I moved this light up. And this light shot probably should have been up a little bit higher as well. But it also just gives more atmosphere. It gives a little bit more depth to it. Um, I think it looks a lot cooler. It's, it's an optional thing. I definitely think it looks cooler. It also took over a minute longer. So that's, that's over 25% longer. And as you increase the samples, that will go up even more. Uh, the other thing I want to call attention to is if we look closely here, the way that the denoising worked here. Now, I have to say, the open image denoise uh, option worked really well for this. It's still uneven, and that's because the samples are too low. But if we instead used the NLM option, the denoising would have looked like this. It would have been super splotchy and not something that would be even close to usable. So uh, hats off to Intel. That, that did work pretty well. Um, but there's definitely still you know cause to increase the samples a bit. Um, and then I guess another note about 
position in these lights. If we zoom in here, it's kind of subtle, but you can see where the light is because it's not, there's no more kind of red glow above this area. Let's see the lines like right there. So to avoid that, there's a couple things that you can do. Uh, one, if we just brought this wall up, we probably wouldn't notice that. Uh, but we could move the light up or we could reframe the camera so we don't see that. Which is probably what I would do for a final, uh, final render. But uh, I think that really covers everything that I wanted to cover in this video. Uh, as far as render settings, and it's really just take the time to give everything a once over, make sure it looks good, and then get your render settings set. Um, make sure you have you're using some denoising, because that'll really save you time. And then if you don't need to use caustics, then don't use them. Um, and that'll save you a fair amount of time as well. Just the last thing is uh, progressive refine. So what progressive refine is. If I, if I enable that, and we'll go to slot 3 here. I hit render. The way this is going to work is it's going to work kind of like render preview in the viewport, in that it's going to render everything at once. Now, this is a slower option as far as render time, but what it allows you to do is just to let a render, let a render run, um, so you can set the samples really high. Oops, I accidentally hit escape. You let the render run, and then when it gets to the level of denoising that you like, you know, the, the noise is, is not denoising, but um, the level of noise that you like, you can stop the render. Um, so that's an option, too. But uh, that was a slightly long-winded way of, of getting you rendered and um, getting some final images. Well, not final images, but rendered images. In the next video and the final video of our cyberpunk saga, we will take those images and do some compositing or bring them into the compositor and uh, do some post-processing on them to get a nice polished image. So that's next uh, right now.